So hi guys. Uh, today our speaker is Martin Kressa from uh, Bangkok Fundamental Physics Group, Department of Physics, Chulalongkorn University, Thailand. He's going to speak about uh, teleparallel theories of gravity, recent progress and challenges. Thank you, Martin, for accepting this invitation to give this talk. This is the 92 talk in the series of QASTM. So this is the 92nd talk. And uh, we hope we, we can able to learn something from Terry Parallel Theories of Gravity from you in this talk. So you can start from your end. OK, so, so th thank you very much, Sir Anton, for inviting me here. Uh, so I will be talking about Teleparallel Theories of Gravity. And basically, the outline of this talk is to give you a small introduction. What are these teleparallel theories of gravity? Because like when you open our archive, I mean, like every every week, you have like a couple of maybe sometimes even 10 papers about teleparallel gravity or some kind of modified teleparallel gravity, which is like this FT gravity or some kind of teleparallel dark energy models or something like that. So it's a very active field of research. And there are still a lot of people who uh, don't know about it so much. So I would like to just give you a small like introduction. And I would like to focus in this introduction on like two important topics. And I would like to make a quite a big distinction between these two things when we discuss teleparallel gravity, uh, because often it somehow gets blurred. So my so first is like, could yes? you speak a little bit louder because it is recording. That's why. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, Wait, I, I can't check my mi microphone. Uh, ah, okay, sorry, because I'm using the... Is it better now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'll try to speak a little bit closer to the, uh, to the uh, microphone. Uh, so basically, I will try to focus on these two aspects, like and try to make a dis distinction distinction between these two things. Like first is like to, how to use this teleparallel gravity just to understand general relativity itself, and then I will try to distinguish it from this like uh, when we try to do some of these new theories of gravity, such as FT gravity. Yes, and then I will try to talk about some open questions in the field, and there is many of them I, I can say. So basically, before I move to teleparallel gravity, let me just say that, uh, well, let me just start with general relativity. And basically with suggestion, like try to, like, try to make you see it general relativity in this way. Yeah, it's like, when I start with general relativity, basically general relativity is built on two kind of like a building blocks. Yes, and the first building block is the Riemannian geometry. So, what, the, what does it mean is that the rule of parallel transport is given by the Riemannian or so-called Levi-Civita connection, which is this like a symmetric and metric compatible connection. We usually we don't think about it uh, when we learn GR, but this is actually one big assumption which we do. And uh, geometry as a consequence of this is described, described in terms of the metric and the curvature only. Yes? So this is the first choice first building block which we choose when we are building general relativity. And the second uh, building block is, of course, the einstein hilbert action. Yeah? Because it means that I just choose my geometry and then I choose my action because, well, I cannot just build a theory out of geometry without saying what is my action. And it's surprisingly, uh, surprisingly, the, the, the most surprising fact about general relativity, it turns out that the most simple action which you can create in this Riemannian geometry, which is just a scalar curvature, yes, this is the most simple action that you can imagine, it's the correct one. This is this Einstein-Hilbert action. Yeah, and the Einstein-Hilbert action really leads to the correct Einstein field equation. But this Einstein-Hilbert action has some very surprising properties. And these surprising properties are are mainly the fact that it contains the second derivatives of the metric, but still leads to the second order field equation. Yes? And I will, I will be returning to this topic uh, more and more uh, yeah, during this uh, talk. 
and I'll try to explain like why it's important. Yeah, because like normally what you when you would see this action, and you would see that it contains the second derivatives of the metric, you would automatically assume like, oh, I have force for the field equations, and we know that force or the field equations they are typically problematic. But it's not the case of general relativity. General relativity is actually very special uh, theory, and this specialty is very very unique for general relativity in this Riemannian geometric framework. So what does it mean, this Riemannian geometry? W one so thing I just want to ask that uh, in general, uh, so I can understand Einstein-Hilbert action from that you can find equation of motion by varying that everything is okay. But why you are just restricting by taking the Einstein-Hilbert action in the general relativity because uh, you can consider the higher uh, derivative terms, uh, not only uh, so like I don't, don't know which dimension you are talking about, but in general arbitrary dimension you can consider uh, the higher derivative terms like Gauss Bonnet, some f of r gravities and all. So why you are not including uh, that in the general relativistic des descriptions? Well, when I do general relativity, I usually mean. Uh... In general relativity, I have only Einstein-Hilbert action, yes? I mean, if I start to do FR gravity, I'm not doing general relativity. I'm already modifying gravity. Yes. Oh, in that so way, you're calling, calling modified gravity. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, exactly. I will be returning to that, yes? For me, all these kind of things are modified gravity, yes? General relativity for me is something which leads to Einstein field equations, yes? So Einstein-Hilbert action and Einstein field equations. Yes, uh, I will be return. I will be talking about this exactly like when I modify it, yes, or extend it, exactly okay. like FR gravity or some quadratic gravity. Then I have something else, yes. Okay. So, uh, so basically, the meaning. So, but just for these first three slides, let's just stay with a pure, simple general relativity in four dimensions. Nothing changing. Just a good old fashioned general relativity. So basically, what does it mean? It, this Riemannian geometry, like what's the geometry picture of this Riemannian geometry? Well, this is something which we usually learn in uh, like an introduc introduction to GR. We have this like a geo geodesic parallelogram. So it means like I take one geodesic and then the second geodesic, and then I do it in an opposite way. I try to return back home, yes, with, through these geodesics. And if I, so I form this, this is usually called like a geodesic parallelogram, yes? And if I have Riemannian geometry, it turns out that this geodesic parallelogram actually closes, but the vector, which was like parallelly transported uh, along this ge geodesic parallelogram, it returns at the same point, the same origin point, but it, it is rotated, okay? So for example, like this is a really observable effect because you can think about a Foucault pendulum, Yes, a Foucault pendulum is basically a parallelly transported along the like a rotation of Earth. Yeah, like how Earth is rotating, you can see it as a as a uh, some vector being parallelly transported, and exactly that angle how it is rotating is pro is actually proportional to the curvature. Yeah? So and exactly, so this is nice thing. Uh, this is the interpretation of the Riemannian geometry. Yeah, and then usually that's exactly the same time what we are talking about. Like we are interested sometimes also in these modified theories of gravity or like like to call modified theories of gravity or some theories of gravity beyond general relativity. So I, I okay. just want to make a comment. Like this parallel transport, you mean that once you come back, the vector will be rotated. Isn't it like similar kind of thing once you talk about, I'm just trying to make a connection. Like, in electrodynamics, we call something called uh, gauge potentials, MUs. So it's basically uh, like, uh, you know that it, it is not uh, exactly, so, so it changes with the gauge choice. So like my point is like uh, in quantum field theories or maybe any kind of field theories, if something is very gauge dependent and uh, if you do after doing the gauge transformation, you will see that the things are dependent on the space time, which we sometimes call the local gauge transformation. Isn't it like similar type of thing effect is in the space time also there? 
Uh, well, in some way, yes, uh, but uh, I mean, in some way, yes. I mean, it's it's like a proportion, like it's given by the connection coefficients, yes. Uh, so in some way, it is similar, but it's not completely gauge transformation. I mean, I wouldn't no, think about not, it like it's a not ga completely gauge transformation, but but like because of this notion, there is some kind of understanding called gauge gravity duality. So this kind of ideas are there. Uh, Yes, but that I, that I would think it's quite different. I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, this is just means like that. Uh, uh, this is just a geometric concept. It just means that. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, what does it mean? It's like you just do a geodesic. So you just move. Yes. So basically, you imagine you free fall in one way, then you free fall in one way, then in the opposite way back. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about it. Yeah. Okay. In some way, you can think about it also similar to gauge uh, transformations in electromagnetism. Yes, because basically, then the field strength also is somehow related to this coefficient uh, yeah. connection coefficients in electromagnetism. But yes, I mean those are not. Space time, yes. I mean, there is a big difference. Between no, no, I'm, if I'm you have a gauge this theory. Is, I'm saying this, this is different. I'm saying that similarly. Yeah, okay. In some way, yes. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure whether, yeah, in some way it is similar, yeah, but uh, not completely. Yeah. Uh, so basically, then, uh, if you try to go like beyond general relativity, yes, what we usually do are what usually people do when they try to go beyond general relativity and, and extend uh, general relativity. I will return to this a little bit later and explain like what's our motivation for that. Uh, we usually, what we do is uh, we modify only the action. Yeah? So we still assume that our gravity is described in terms of the Riemannian geometry. Yes? And we are modifying just basically the action. So this is the case exactly like of all these like FR gravity theories, or, or all these quadratic uh, uh, gravity theories, or wild gravity theories, Hojava Lipschitz gravity, massive gravity. Yeah, I mean, the, all these theories still assume that we have a Riemannian geometry. But exactly, it turns out that this is a difficult task. I mean, it's not so easy to actually modify gravity in a consistent way. And it turns out it's exactly because GR Lagrangian is a unique Lagrangian with second order field equations in four dimensions, which depends on the metric only. Yes? And this is the famous Lanzer Lovelock theorem. It, it is different in higher dimensions, or you have to start modifying something. Yes? So, usually, if you would start to take any functions of the Riemannian curvature, Yes, try to do some kind of quadratic gravity or wild gravity or something like that. You will basically find out that uh, yeah, you start to run into this problem of like higher derivative uh, Lagrangians, and you will have higher derivative uh, theories. So it means the theories which field equations are fourth order, and from fourth order field equations typically uh, imply that we have a problem with Gauss-Ostrogradsky uh, instability. So or gauss ostrogradsky ghost. And it turns out that there are only very few exceptions to this. And one of these exceptions is FR gravity. That's because it's some kind of like a degenerate case. And it turns out that even if it's like force over field theory, it's actually, it's healthy and it doesn't have any Ostrogradsky ghost. But it turns out that it's not Ostrogradsky ghosts are not the only possible ghosts which you can have. You can actually have further Gauss instabilities, like Bolver the Desser ghosts. So, for example, this was the problem with the this early massive gravity theories, and it took about twenty or thirty years uh, to actually uh, solve this problem. So, the question is like, how to find these consistent modified theories of gravity? Yeah? It's like so we are generally I, interested. I have a question here. So, how to differentiate between the different types of ghosts in the gravity theories? Could you please comment on that? Because we know that different types of hosts appear in the theories. So could you please tell us about that 
how we can able to differentiate them what are the properties and what do you mean by exactly ghost here well ghosts are typically uh, some uh, some negative energy states that you can have right so that's basically one of this is this gauss ostrogratsky stability it just means that you can have some uh, states with uh, infinite negative energy and it means that it can make your uh, uh, system of field equations completely unstable it's always the problem when this state with negative energy coupled to your in principle it's not always the problem the problem is when it couples to your physical degrees of freedom yes? because it means that if you can if you have a, some state which has an infinite negative and can get infinite negative energy then if it is couples to your physical degrees of freedom you can get some uh, like a, a infinite positive energy and it, your theories can start to blow up uh, I, I'm not expert on these like Bolver desert ghosts, but they are kind of the ghosts which are appearing in massive gravity theories. So they are not uh, ghosts which appear because of higher derivative problems. Yes, like these Ostrogratsky instabilities or Ostrogratsky ghosts, they are the ghosts which are coming from a fourth order field so, equation or in, higher order field equation. So massive gravity here, you actually mean about uh, the tensor perturbations, because um, till now you have mentioned whatever it is a geometric. Now, if you call it massive gravity, I hope there should be a term like M square H mu nu H mu nu. Okay. Yes, it's, yes. Yeah. So it's basically the uh, perturbations in the uh, metric you are talking about the yeah, linearized yeah. okay okay yeah yeah this is typically the case of this kind of ghost it's like in these linear perturbations uh, which are not coming from higher derivatives yes they are coming from somewhere else yes and simply if you just write your propagators you will see that there are some propagators which have uh, negative energy true true yes, yes. okay uh, so so but basically the idea here is that uh, so this was like this one possible way is try to modify the action or equation and still be using the Riemannian geometry or if you go if you decide to go like you know all the way I mean like why we should if we go a completely crazy with our modifying gravity and uh, trying to search for more fundamental theories of gravity why we should skip this Riemannian geometry in principle we can also try to modify this geometry part of the theory right and this is completely possible since in differential geometry this metric tensor yes or the tetrad i talk about tetrads because tetrads is what's fundamental in teleparallel gravity yes you can still think this tetrad and basically some kind of like a square root of the metric uh, so this metric or tetrad and the connection which is defining the rule of parallel transport and it again depends like in which basis you work so it's usually these gammas like your linear connections or when you work in this what we call unholonomic basis non-coordinate basis you usually have the spin connections then it turns out that this connection and metric in principle they are completely independent structure yeah and it also means that you can define various rules of parallel transport uh, simultaneously, basically, the very same space time. And the Riemannian connection is only one special choice which we are doing. Yes? This is one special choice where we basically assume that uh, torsion is zero at one metricity zero, where we have only curvature. Yes? This is one choice. But we have this much more general structure, which is called metric affine geometries. Yes? Metric affine geometries are such geometries where metric and a connection or tetrag and a connection they are completely independent and the connection is characterized by curvature torsion and non-metricity tensors and basically you get this like very nice picture that you have this like metric affine geometries and then usually what we do is like this is the most general
Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hello? suddenly my connection <laughs> stopped. Okay, because I also have some problems with connection, sorry. <laughs> so uh, so basically this teleparal connection is uh, another possibility to Riemannian connection. And there's also the so-called symmetric teleparal geometry. This is uh, some geometry which has uh, zero torsion and zero curvature and everything described in terms of non-metricity. And I will be not talking about it uh, very much today. And basically, so this teleparal geometry, yeah, so this geometry uh, in this picture here, I mean, in this, place, in this place here, it basically has a very, very funny history. And it's actually the history is now slowly approaching to be, well, 100 years. And it actually originated with Einstein, Einstein uh, attempt uh, to unify gravity and electrom electromagnetism. Yes, I mean we know that. I mean Einstein was very successful in 1915 with a GR, but then like from 20, uh, couple of attempts to unify gravity and electromagnetism, which didn't go very well. And one of these approaches, which didn't go very well, is actually how teleparal gravity has started. And it's actually a very funny start, story because it was 1928. And actually, it's, I found this article, I think it's from Times or I don't know from exactly from where. Basically, Einstein thought that this is his most valuable theory. Uh, so he really thought a lot. He saw that he unified gravity and electromagnetism. But it turned out to be actually quite embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there is this uh, quote which I found somewhere by Pauli. Yes, Pauli said that, well, the teleparallelism is like horrible nonsense. Yes, I mean that it's such a horrible nonsense that he, the Einstein, can just is this rubbish. He can impress only American journalists, not even American critics. So this turned out to be quite, quite big embarrassment, I would say, uh, for Einstein. Because exactly because he was trying to unify it with electromagnetism and he was confusing, uh, he was trying to in introduce electromagnetism in some very, very weird way, which turned out to be completely wrong. So this was completely forgotten after 1932. Uh, this distant parallelism or teleparallelism was completely forgotten. And, but then it was kind of rediscovered in 1961 by Christian Muller who was working on this conservation laws in general relativity. And he found that uh, actually, if you don't try to um, like make our teleparallel gravity like a some unified theory and have this electromagnetism there in some artificial way, that theory actually makes very good sense. Yes, but it's not a unified theory. It is actually just general relativity in some new, uh, formalism. So basically, from a, I mean, there's a lot of history and these ideas that were uh, evolving in uh, different ways. But basically, from a, what I would call a modern definition, from a modern definition, I would say that uh, teleparal geometry is defined by the zero curvature and zero non metricity. Yeah? And as soon as you have this, like a condition on your connection, the most general solution as that your connection is this pure gauge connection or teleparallel spin connection, yes? which is given just by this pure gauge form. So I think this is Sayantan what you were asking. Yes? I mean, you see, like actually this connection with gauge theories is, is actually, uh, is actually much deeper. And I will show you later in teleparallel gravity than in classical GR. It's actually one of the most interesting aspects of teleparallel gravity. And it turns out that, yeah, so this connection, which is here, it really depends on the choice of the frame only. And it's like what we call pure inertial connection. So it means it act, 
as the same as describing accelerated frames in special relativity. And then it turns out that non-trivial geometry, well, since you have curvature zero and non-metricity zero, then it turns out that the only thing which you have there is torsion. So you are using torsion to describe non-trivial geometry in the same way as you are using curvature to describe non-trivial geometry in Riemannian geometry. So kind of the geometric interpretation of this is that when you do this, and now you will see like why it has this weird name teleparallel, is exactly because if you try to do this kind of geodesic parallelogram uh, in using teleparallel connection, yeah, so you do geodesic geodesics with respect to uh, to the uh, teleparallel connection, you will find now that this uh, parallelogram like doesn't close, but basically this uh, pa parallelly transported vector it arrives at a different point but they basically stay kind of parallel yeah so this is why we say the transport vectors stay parallel at distance or teleparallel yeah? because tele means uh, at the distance in greek so this deviation is basically dependent on the torsion yeah yeah basically it's proportional to the torsion yes But basically, that's just a ge geometry picture. And as soon as I de define this ge uh, geometry in this way, as I have defined it, well, I can start to build uh, some gravity theory out of it. Yeah? And it turns out that there is one special case when I can take this teleparallel geometry and basically just reformulate general relativity in terms of this teleparallel geometry. And it turns out that there is one special Lagrangian which is given by this thing, which is called torsion scalar. So in GR, we have this curvature scalar. We now have torsion scalar. And this torsion scalar has some very weird form. And you will see later why it has to have this very special form. And But you take the Lagrangian, which is like the uh, uh, this is linear torsion scalar, and you define this telepar, and you, find you do a variation. And you find these teleparallel field equations. And these teleparallel field equations where this S is some super we call superpotential, and this is some L energy moment tensor for gravity, and this is an energy moment tensor of the matter. Yes. This looks very different uh, from general relativity, but it turns out that this is completely equivalent to general rel relativity. Yes. So I'm in general relativity where this einstein dual prediction and this Einstein equations. In teleparallel gravity, we have this teleparallel Lagrangian and teleparallel field equation. And the point is, these two things, they are completely equivalent. And how you can see this equivalence is that you can use some very important theorem in differential geometry, which is called a rich theorem, which tells you that you can always write your teleparallel spin connection as a Riemannian connection, uh, sorry, here is missing this uh, circle, which means a Riemannian connection. Yeah, so teleparallel connection equals to Riemannian connection plus the contortion. Sorry, here is something missing. Uh, and when you do this, you can show that basically this Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian, yeah, so this and this teleparallel Lagrangian, they are related just by some uh, total derivative term. So if you use this, you see that this. Uh, the field equations derived from this Lagrangian and this Lagrangian are the same, yeah, because the total derivative will, will not uh, I mean, change the field equations. So it means that theories are dynamically equivalent because they differ just by the total derivative term. So it means that uh, even though you have something very weird, you have to, like everything in terms of torsion and the field equations look like this, you have the same field equations uh, as in GR, they are just written in a very weird variables. I mean, weird from the viewpoint of general relativity, but in terms that those field equations, they are equivalent to general relativity. So it means that it has the same solutions as general relativity, you know, same Schwarzschild, same care and everything. This, this theory is completely indistinguishable from general relativity as far as field equations goes. So, now the question is like, well, okay, 
uh, if it is equivalent to general relativity, uh, why we should be actually interested in that? I mean, like, is it just some, isn't this just like some kind of fancy trick to, I mean, write your field equations in some weird way? Well, I hope that not. And I think there are three good reasons, like why you sh should give some thought, like why these teleportal theories of gravity are interesting, like why we should actually consider them. And it's first like it's the first thing is that it's important for fundamental understanding of what is gravity. And I mean this is like very philosophical question, but important, but it's important and interesting. And I will show in the next slide what I mean by this. And it's also interesting for like a pro we know that there are some problems in general relativity, so maybe we can get some like interesting insight. And also like new ways how to modify the field of gravity, how to modify GR. And I will talk about this uh, at the end. So this first reason what I just said is like uh, it's important because it gives us some interesting insight, like what is gravity? Yeah? Because usually we say. There's this very famous quote by Wheeler, which says, like, space time tells matter how to move, matter tells space time how to curve. Like, but that's true only because we use the Riemannian connection to describe geometry in terms of curvature. Right? In teleparallel gravity, we describe the very same physics in terms of torsion. Yeah, so we have the same Schwarzschild solution, but since we have different connection, it has zero curvature. Right? So maybe, yeah, it has non zero Riemannian curvature. But actually, in teleparallel tele connection, it has zero curvature by definition, and it has non-zero torsion. So basically, it means that space-time tells matter not how to move and matter tells matter how to curve, but also maybe how to torsion. So from this philosophical viewpoint, it's, I think, very interesting and very important. And it's not just that the philosophical, like, oh, is gravity a curvature or is gravity a torsion? It also is. It has some nice, interesting insights. And one of these insights is like, well, when I was, I don't know, 15 or 16 back in high school, and we were studying electromagnetism and Newtonian gravity, uh, the, you know, electromagnetism for me in high school was Coulomb law. Yeah? So you have this uh, uh, like a law which says that the, the stre field strength is proportional, uh, the electromagnetic force is proportional to the inverse of the uh, square of distance, yes? Newton and gravity is very similar in this 18th century physics, yes? I mean, Coulomb law and Newtonian gravitational law, they are very, very similar. But then when you go further and you learn about maximal electrodynamics and then about general relativity, you start to see that, well, these theories are very, very different. Yes? I mean, like maximal field equations can be written like this, Yes, yeah, so, I mean, uh, where you have this like a Faraday tensor or excitation tensor. I mean, in language of differential forms, you can write it in this very, very nice form through some Hodge duals. And general relativity, you have Bianchi identities, yes, so something like equivalent to this, but the Einstein equations, which, are, well, this doesn't look very similar. But it turns out that if you actually work in teleparallel gravity, well, you can write equations of basically teleparallel equivalent of GR in a such nice form that it almost looks like Maxwell theory or some kind of young Mills theory. Yes? You can, those field equations which I wrote before in language of the differential forms, you can write them as Bianchi identity, which would be just this exterior covariant derivative of the torsion equals to zero. In the field equations you can write like uh, exterior, uh, uh, covariant exterior derivative of the super potential uh, two form plus this uh, self interaction term equals to this. Sorry, that should be some kappa uh, equals uh, to the uh, form of the uh, uh, energy momentum of the matter me 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 energy momentum or one form. Uh, and you can also write it using this some kind of generalization of Hodge dual, you can even write it in such form that the super potential can be written as some kind of this, uh, let's call it teleparallel generalization of a Hodge dual. So this really takes a form of the Maxwell electrodynamics, which I think is completely beautiful structure. 
Yeah, so this is quite interesting because it allows you to see general relativity, this teleparal formulation, as a complete equivalent of Maxwell electrodynamics. Not complete equivalent, but in a similar, similar way. And this can be taken up like even further. And you can really see there's a gauge theory for like a billion group of translations. So there's like a lot of interesting papers by Cho from 1976 up to some recent papers by Obufo and Pereira in 2019 and Morgan Ledelio and some other people. They have like some number of interesting papers about this. Yes? Uh, uh, I have uh, two questions. First of all, we know that Einstein gravity is quite consistent with uh, a lot of late time uh, observations like uh, perihelion precision of mercury, even a lot of cosmological uh, implications and all. And if you go for some modified gravity, you actually try to, to match with all these findings, you constrain the parameters of the theory. So if I want to use steady parallel gravity to match the known stuff, then what parameters should I constrain? Uh, yes, that's what I will be talking a little bit later because this is still I'm talking about just this teleparallel equivalent of general relativity. Okay. okay, so this is this theory is completely equivalent to general relativity. You will obtain absolutely the same. Uh, it will obtain absolutely the same prediction for all experiments, exactly because uh, these field equations, yes, these Einstein equations, and these these teleparallel equations, they are completely equivalent to other. So you cannot actually constrain anything with the same constraint as you have from general relativity. But that's why it's important to be distinguishing these two cases when I have this teleparallel equivalent of GR. And then when I will have these modified theories of gravity. And of course, in these modified theories of gravity, like these modified teleparallel theories of gravity, such as FT gravity, then you can start to have some like restrictions from observations. Okay. But that's a second topic. Yes, I mean, first, I'm trying just to do a general relativity in this very fancy language of teleparallel geometry. And since you have tried to connect with the gauge theory for abelian group, what exact kind of group theory you are talking about exactly here? Is it kind of the usual Lorentz group or something a little bit different? Well, it actually turns, it's, it's a kind of, it's not completely, uh, yeah, but basically, uh, it's a very special kind of gauge theory. And there is still a lot of argument, like, like in the last five years, there were like about three or four like conflicting papers by some other people, not by me, who are like more active in this like gauge theory aspect of teleparallel gravity. And basically they are still trying to figure it out, I would say, uh, because it's not completely same as a gauge leg. Like, it's not the same as like Maxwell theory or Young Mills theory, yes? Because it turns out that it's not a gauge theory for Lorentz transformations. This is usually what people are trying to do when people do gauge theory of gravity, like back in the 60s, 70s, yes? It turns out that it's actually translations. So you are gauging only translations. But it turns out that you then still have to introduce there uh, Lorentz transformations, but the Lorentz transformations are introduced in some kind of like a, let's call it a, not completely trivial way, but in a such way that they are only purely, uh, purely, purely gauge connections for this Lorentz transformation. And that makes it like a little bit, uh, I mean, it's still not completely the resolved uh, topic, I would say. Yes, but basically the idea of total gravity is that it's a gauge theory for translations, right? Okay. Uh, does this okay? It, it's does it answer what I what you were asking? Okay. Yes. Okay. So basically, then the second reason why to consider this uh, teleparallel gravity 
is that, well, since it's echelon theories, it's still echelon theories, when we say that this is teleportal echelon of GR, the only we mean is it's equivalent on the level of the field equations. And the field equations are absolutely the same, but on the level of the action, it's actually quite a big difference. And it's exactly because this uh, curvature scalar of Riemannian geometry is proportional to this torsion scalar plus this total derivative term. Yes? And we know exactly that the total derivative term, that's actually the, the difficult part, I mean, the confusing part of general relativity, because we know that in GR, these uh, second derivatives in this boundary term, they are causing various problems. So typically, even in GR, we have to introduce, we actually know that Einstein-Hilbert action is not a good action for gravity. We actually have to introduce this gibbons hawking york boundary term, and then regularize these expressions in order to have a fully consistent uh, action principle for general relativity. Okay. So basically, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we have this uh, in gibbons hawking 1974, they basically said that if you want to have some like consistent renormalized gravitational action, I must have this Einstein-Hilbert action plus this gibbons hawking or boundary term minus some reference uh, minus some gibbons hooking or boundary term for some reference metric. So what do they call it? The background subtraction. So it's kind of weird uh, thing happening in GR. It turns out that in uh, teleparallel gravity, uh, I mean, I have a paper from 2015 and 2016 about this. It turns out that you can basically think about it as about no way how to regularize the gravitational action in teleparallel gravity. But it turns out that how you're regularizing this action is only by finding this proper spin connection to your action. And that's actually exactly taking away these, uh, these divergences which are happening here in the Gibbons Hawking your boundary terms. And I will have in a couple of weeks or months, I will have one actually one interesting paper about this that will try to explore this uh, uh, topic more. Uh, could you please explain what do you mean by regularization of the action? Because as far as I know that you can regulate your theory if you treat to be something like a quantum field theory or some quantum gravity theory. Okay, so are you doing some kind of quantum field theory calculation? Because as far as I can understand, this is a geometric prescription. And you have... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you yeah. mean like, like here in Gibbons Hawking? Like yeah. this is just in a GR, yes? So basically yeah. in a GR, yes? So you have the Einstein Hilbert, like imagine that, uh, like this is actually, this is like one of the most beautiful papers ever written for me in physics, yes? Uh, uh, so basically what does it mean is like, you, if you take Einstein Hilbert action, yes? And let's say, take it for Schwarzschild, yes? Einstein Hilbert action for Schwarzschild is zero because scalar curvature for Schwarzschild is zero. Yes, I mean, it's a vacuum space time, scalar curvature zero. So, but it turns out that the action of, of uh, GR is not just Einstein-Hilbert term. You have to add this boundary term there, which is called this gibbons hawking your boundary term. This boundary term uh, is exactly there in order to cancel some of these variations coming from these variations of the second derivatives, which are in this bound uh, in, in these like the second derivatives of the metric here. Uh, you if you, if you do variations, you have to put there something which cancels those variations. And that's exactly this Gibbons Hawking or boundary term. So and then basically what you do is so you can imagine that well okay in asymptotically flat space time, you can say like, oh, I don't have a boundary, but you can basically build your boundary at some distance and then just send it to infinity. Yeah. And if you do it from this, uh, using this Gibbons hooking your boundary term, it turns out that it diverges. You will find out that uh, if you do this for a classical uh, uh, Schwarzschild space time, you will find out there is some divergence. No, for, for the classical that... case, I have understood what you have said. But if I translate the language in the quantum side, 
immediately comes into my mind that even the gravitational action described by Einstein Hilbert in the quantum regime is incomplete. So you can't stop that. Yeah, level. yeah, but 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 this this thing here, guys. Uh, just let, let me finish. Yes, and you have to put there this like this is basically some kind of counter term. Yes, but there is a big difference. I think what you are talking about, uh, like when we talk about quantum gravity and regularization, you would think about it like, oh, this is some, you know, uh, when we talk about quantization, you would think about this. Oh, there's some UV effects. Yes. Like yes. short distance divergence. High energy, high energy effects. These are these effects which we are here talking about, like this regularization. These are infrared divergences of the action. Okay. But and so but, in asymptotically flat space time, in asymptotically flat space time, it's usually done through this big round subtraction. But that's actually quite interesting because then when you go to ADS space times, it turns out that this is actually not completely possible to do yes? because you cannot subtract this background in this way yeah that's uh, why I was just a little uh, bit confused because yeah uh, provided you have to know the metric that uh, all the space times metric you can't able to regularize the ir divergences like uh, you have mentioned like yeah uh, yeah yes. yeah yeah, so so seventy four, yes, uh, they they were talking about just asymptotically flat space times, and there oh, you can really do it by this flat space time. It is quite okay, but like if yeah. you if you talk about d seater or anti d seater or something like that, maybe I I, yeah. I you know. and in anti d seater space time, yeah, it turns out to be the same, yes, except this this you don't have any reference space time, but you still have to. It still has some divergences coming from here, but then you have but, to add here. You have to add there this counter term. Yeah, probably uh, ADS is basically asymptotically flat. That's why, right. but DC term is not. This no term ADS is, is not. ADS is not asymptotically flat. But yeah, people study the asymptotic uh, flat limit from the ADS space time, like. Uh, people compute the correlation functions in ADS, take the asymptotic limit, and compute, compute, study the things in the flat space time limit. People usually do frequently. Uh, yeah, yeah, but but actually, the funny part about this is, like, if you want to do this in ADS space time, then you still have to add here this some like a counter term. But you add here this counter term, which uh, so it's still to Basically, this action here for ADS space time, this part will have some infrared divergence. Then you have to add there some counter term. The counter term cancel this. And basically, that's the idea of like ADS TFT correspondence. Yes. Like basically, these counter terms on this boundary of the space time, yes, because this is a boundary term. Yes. So basically, the, this infrared divergence is coming from the boundary. They can be interpreted as a as a UV divergences of this dual field theory in ADS CFT correspondence. Okay. Yes. So there in ADS CFT correspondence, you actually obtain this very, you know, this very interesting link between this UV and infrared uh, mixing. Yes, like that this duality between UV effects and infrared effects. I think it's one of the most beautiful discoveries also ever made. Yes, I mean, you will start to see that, yeah, these infrared divergences of the gravitational action, they are proportional to some, in, uh, I don't know, UV divergences of some uh, physical theory of the boundary. Okay. Uh, in Desiter space time, it's not completely clear yet because in Desiter uh, space time, I think people try to regularize it in some way. I'm not. Desiter is not. Desiter uh, is not infrared uh, uh, regulable. Yeah, because that's a finite space time. Yes, yeah? so that's not uh, that's not divergent. Yes, yes. I, I, exactly. That's not di di divergent. Yeah. Yes. But let's say there is this uh, like a paper which does this uh, is by. Per Klaus, and then uh, I'm sorry for what's his name? Bala, is this Indian uh, Balasubram? 
uh, sorry, <laughs> there's this uh, space, uh, very interesting paper about how to regularize ADS uh, spacetime, which is like a, one of the foundational papers uh, for ADS CFT, uh, ADS CFT correspondence. Okay. And they exactly try to interpret these counter terms for ADS space stuff in terms of the some uh, like a UV effects, uh, UV uh, regularized regularization in dual field theory. Okay. So basically, uh, as as long as we stay in this like teleparallel form of GR, there are still like kind of few open questions, and those few open questions is. Uh, Basically, what is this physical meaning? Yes, I think it's kind of very underappreciated, like uh, because everybody's like, oh, we can general relativity is about curvature of the space time. Yes, but basically, now we see it like from philosophical viewpoint, like well, it also was. This, we have a kind of dual theory to general relativity, where we view general relativity in terms of uh, torsion. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think quite interesting kind of duality. And basically, there is this very interesting paper by Eleanor Knox from 2011, basically uh, was suggesting that you can see this relation to GR and teleparallel form of GR as some kind of like analog, relativistic analog of a Newton and Newton Cartan gravity. Yeah. Uh, there's also like, like some of the open questions so that's why one of the way how to see yeah like uh, how to see this relation between these uh, two theories the second open question in teleparallel equivalent gr as like there are all of these weird definitions of um, of energy momentum and the question is like do they offer any advantage of gr expression so i have recently uh, some paper about it like two weeks or three weeks ago with my russian colleagues and uh, there were a lot of these claims that there exists an improved tensorial definition of energy momentum, but actually, as we show, it's still kind of tricky when in teleparallel gravity. So another open question is like, this is what I'm trying to work out now, is with asymptotic structure, is trying to understand the asymptotic structures of the action in teleparallel gravity compared to GR. And mainly the idea is like how to go from this asymptotically flat to ADS spacetime or asymptotically uh, ADS and Desitter space times. Uh, still open question is this uh, gauge formulation. I mean, there are still a lot of this like discussions in 2018, 2019, there were like three or four papers. And still, uh, even these papers, which discuss this gauge formulation of teleparallel on GR, uh, well, they are like very foundational, but they, uh, they still don't show you like how to utilize this, uh, this gauge aspect teleparallel gravity. I think this is one of the uh, interesting thing which we should like uh, try to explore more, like for the, what the practical consequence of this gauge structure of teleparallel gravity. Is there any actually? I, I still don't know. And the grand question I think when you deal with teleparallel one of GR is, uh, it seems like you can reinterpret many problems in a new way. The question is, do you actually solve these old problems, or you just basically are reshuffling your problems uh, in terms of other, I mean, other language. Yes, I, I still don't know actually. Uh, I hope uh, I hope that we are actually obtaining some new solutions to some problems, or at least building some foundations for answering some of these problems. Yeah, because it's always useful to see some problem from multiple angles. So I think it's quite. Uh, important and for example at least for this like action principle or for this conservation laws you can see that actually teleparallel gravity offers some interesting insights which are quite useful and and then uh the the third reason why actually teleparallel gravity is like a popular is because it allows us to modify gravity in some very novel ways okay? uh, and before I go to these novel ways of uh, modifying gravity, like first, like why we actually want to modify gravity. Right? And I think I'll talk something like my zero reason, like which is not the actual re reason, is like we know that GR is not some final theory. 
and probably it's just some approximations. We know that there's some more fundamental theory of gravity, yeah, some quantum gravity. We don't know what is exactly quantum gravity, but we know that it basically can be viewed as some kind of modification. I mean, some effective theory of this quantum gravity will look like GR plus some modification. Yeah? But usually when we do this, we would expect like this from this quantum gravity, we would expect that this modification is in the uv distances yes at short distances quantum theory is modifying gravity some, somehow yeah? but actually this is something slightly different than what people do in this modified gravity or extended gravity community because people here actually consider usually like also modifications at large distances yes i mean so like not a short distance modification, but like a large distance modification at cosmological scales. And the reason why people are interested in, interested in this is because, well, gravity is not so well tested in large scales. Right? I mean, it's kind of well tested in a uh, solar system, but as soon as you go somewhere else, uh, some larger distances in principle, principle, there is a possibility that there is some the general relativity is not a full theory. If you consider like cosmology or dynamics of the galaxies as a large scale test of GR, well, then it is basically failing. Yes? I mean, because we need dark energy, we need ma dark matter, we need some inflation. And even if you like introduce all this to your theory, you still have, you still have like even then you still have some problems like this Hubble, ten Hubble tension. Yeah, so in principle, this is one way how to see it. It's like uh, you can uh, try to explain some of these cosmological puzzles like dark energy. Some people also try to explain dark matter. And if you go in the history of universe like inflation, I guess, not by introducing all this dark stuff, but by considering some like- I have a point here. Gravity. I have a point here. So, except modifying gravity, if you modify the matter, what will be the problem? Because maybe all matter will not lead to dark energy or dark matter or inflation, but some of the theories which people used to uh, take from maybe very high energies, like supersymmetry, supergravity, or maybe string theories, various models actually works well. Maybe it is not explaining the Hubble tension. I'm not giving too much attention to the Hubble tension at present, but if I just look into dark energy, dark matter and inflation, modifying matter is okay. But instead of modifying matter, why I should uh, look for modifying the gravity sector? Could you please explain that a little bit? Well, in principle, it's just the other uh, possibility. Yes, I mean, in principle, you have two possibilities yes uh, first uh, try to do well uh, dark matter and dark energy yes uh, well dark matter is kind of problematic i mean you have a lot of candidates but you don't see any of those candidates anywhere yes i mean like yes i mean like supersymmetry and all this gives you quite nice so because candidates. why i have said this there is a point because if you just ask me what will be the candidate for inflaton and what will be the matter content of the dark matter, then uh, immediately uh, you have to uh, uh, look into the theories which gives the matter. Okay, in the yeah, yeah. union. Uh, just modifying gravity will reproduce some of the effects. I'm completely agreeing with you that modification in the gravity sector may produce the galactic rotation curve in dark matter people says that okay so this is kind of an indication that modifying the gravity theories is basically the signatures of uh, it carries the signatures of dark matter or something like that but once somebody asks you about the candidate then i think people should go for uh, the modification in the matter sector well, yeah, yeah. In, well, that's you know two school of thoughts. Yes, I mean, uh, I think that uh, since we are problem of having uh, actually detecting any of those like supersymmetric particles or anything, people are starting to give more thought into this like well modify gravity. Yes, but 
even in modified gravity, it's actually, we don't have any modified gravity theory, a single theory, which would explain everything. Okay, so I mean, I think the same, like, even if you go to this, like modified matter, yes? I mean, you don't have a sim, there's not a single one no, particle the, which would explain 95% of the universe. Supersymmetry you can't detect in the collider, that's true, but you can, that's why I'm calling it kind of an indirect test. So cosmology is one of yeah. the possibilities where you can check whether theory is consistent with cosmic microwave background, or maybe the large scale structure observations, or may, maybe the late time uh, other observations. So people used to uh, take a theory and try to match their parameters and so that uh, th their conclusion is if that matches, then people usually say that, oh, so my theory is basically satisfying those constraints. So that means there is a possibility to detect on all, all these uh, matter contents in the uh, observation and site. So, the, so that, that was my point. I can't detect it in yeah, yeah. collider, that's perfectly true, but that's a direct experiment. But there are, the cosmology is basically the indirect experiment kind of thing. Okay, so. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, so I would tell you like, uh, this is basically just like alternative, alternative approach to the same topic. Yeah? It's like in principle, you should explore both approaches. Uh, so this is just an alternative. But actually, uh, like, I'm not a big expert on like all these details of the like, Hubble tension. I mean, I only like have seen some thoughts. Yes. But for example, this Hubble tension, if I understand it correctly, that would mean that it's not just like even if you have some like a like lambda CDM, yeah, so you will have a like dark energy plus some cold dark matter. It means that still you have this tension in the data. So, this no, like even if you say that, I also feel that even the cosmology community people, those who are dealing with the data, they are not connecting themselves with the theory properly. So maybe CMB gives you some kind of parameter of H naught at the late time and supernova explosions give you different value of H naught at the late time. But people are saying that this is the tension, but people really don't know like which theories like even in the gravity sector or in the matter sector is responsible for that. So I believe that this is a tension obviously, but uh, like people should need to understand that why this tension is coming because first of all they are actually measuring this thing into different different scales cmb is very early time and supernova explosion ha happened very late time okay so my point is uh, like once you even in the modified theories of gravity also like if you write your theories in some cosmological space time so you, you have something called Hubble parameter. You can define that. You have some set of Einstein equations. You can solve that. And you find that your Hubble parameter is basically time dependent or it, it varies with time. So it, my point is it, it may happen that the value of the H at CMB scale and the value of the H at the supernova scale, uh, the fallacy people are saying that it's coming it's not exactly they are measuring the value of H naught. Maybe the H at that particular epoch. That was my point. Yeah, I mean, of course they, I mean, of course they, I mean, uh, of course you measure at the epoch, like you look far away, yes? You, you, yeah. you, you see, it, uh, you are not always measuring just H zero at the, the current time, yes? I mean, uh, I think that they know they know what they are doing. I think I, I actually, I mean, this Hubble tension, yes. Uh, I think this is also, mm, I mean, a lot of people are very excited about this. Like, uh, wow, this could be like a good case for modified gravity. But it seems like there's still a lot of issues, like from a observational viewpoint, yes. Like how they build these ladder distances. Uh, I mean, it seems that maybe this Hubble tension will be completely uh, solved by some technicalities yes. by astronomers. Yes. yes. 
like because they have problems like how the standard candles how they are but yeah. there can be some variation in their standard candles which can be actually explaining this effect right i completely agree with that and uh, probably i must admit that probably it is more probable that just some uh, astronomers have some uh, gap in their knowledge about their standard candles and the standard candle uh, yeah, that, supernova that's star, not that, standard. That's why I was saying uh, that maybe there is a, a little bit gap between the theory people and the observational people. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree that there is quite a big gap and I completely agree. I, I'm just saying that this uh, has to modify gravity and try to understand cosmology. I think one should be very critical about this. Yes, I mean, like in the last five or ten years, like people went completely, I think, a little bit crazy with all kind of possible modifications which you can th think about. And I think we should uh, try to focus more uh, on like trying to understand whether these theories actually make some sense. But it is one of the one of the big selling points. Yes. 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 Of modified gravity is actually to try to understand these cosmological puzzles. And unless you start to claim that, oh, you completely explain it, I think you can still think about it like a, as a valid approach, yes, as a valid alternative approach to making all beyond standard model matter, while you do some beyond general relativity modifications. But you should be very, very careful about what you do. I agree with that. Uh, so you should be very, very critical about the modifications of gravity. Uh, Are you proceed? Anyway. Proceed. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but then also there's like one interesting point about this modified gravity. And actually for me, that's the most important, uh, point like why to play with these modified gravity theories is actually you will learn a lot about general relativity itself yes? like people nowadays they are really mostly interested in this like a uh, cosmology but as i say that's very uh, i mean there's very lot of open questions and we don't have so many data which could distinguish between so many available theories that we have there but actually one good aspect of this is it's interesting to to learn about gr itself because typically when we modify GR itself, we, we destroy some very crucial aspect of it. I mean, or modify something, violate something there, and then you see how it blows up to your face, yes? <laughs> I mean, you start to see like, oh, some ghosts appear somewhere or something, yes? I mean, uh, some gauge symmetry is lost somewhere, and, and now you start to see it somewhere else causing some problem, yes? So I think this modified gravity theories, at least for me, this is my primary motivation in them. It's a really like, it, it helps you to understand many issues in general relativity. And to, you, you start to fully appreciate how compact is general relativity and what are all the constituents of the general relativity itself. Right? But anyway, so in teleparallel framework, yeah, if you start to do this teleparallel gravity, one of the main like a selling point uh, for this, like a huge number of theories which started to appear in the last, I don't know, uh, 10 years, as that you can be constructing field theories, modified theories of gravity, which have second order field equations. Yeah? So you are avoiding these Ostrogratsky goals. Uh, you are avoiding these Ostrogratsky instabilities, which are typically present if you start to modify GR in a classical Riemannian framework so this is why, why last i think in last 15 years it became increasingly popular subject i think there's more than 500 papers or 600 papers about teleparallel gravity and tele modified teleparallel gravity theories in the last 15 years and this basically started like all like around 2007 and this is this ft gravity model right? introduced by ferraro and florini 2006, I think the first, 2006, 2007. And it's basically, uh, if it's basically introduced like some kind of like an uh, analogy to FR gravity. Yes, I mean, general relativity 
usually is given in a classical Riemannian setting by the Einstein-Hilbert action. And in a far gravity, as we take some arbitrary function of the curvature scalar. In teleparallel gravity, you can do the same. We start with this teleparallel Lagrangian, this teleparallel equivalent of GR Lagrangian, which is the distortion scalar, and they make FT gravity and take a Lagrangian, which is an arbitrary function of this torsion scalar. Okay? And since this torsion scalar and curvature scalar differ by total derivative, for nonlinear function f, yes, we you obtain a new gravity model. And it will have a second order field equations because this torsion tensor, torsion scalar, is constructed only out of torsion tensor. I, I have torsion one, tensor. one more question here. So we know that. Uh, initially, when Einstein proposed, he didn't introduce torsion, but later there was a generalized decision called Einstein Karta formalism, where uh, yeah. they have introduced the torsion. So, is it kind of same theory when you haven't tried, you have, you have written at T and uh, then you modify it? Einstein Kartan is a little bit different, yes, because Einstein Kartan. Uh, basically, Einstein Cartan uh, has the, the Lagrangian looks like GR Lagrangian, yes, so it's just a curvature scalar. Okay? But it's not a Riemannian curvature scalar. So it's like R, the curvature scalar, but this R there in Einstein in Einstein Cartan gravity is this Einstein Cartan R. So it's a it's a curvature scalar. Of a connection which has both curvature and torsion. So in Einstein Cartan gravity, you have uh, both curvature and scalar, uh, curvature and torsion. And in Einstein Cartan gravity, this torsion is something like an additional field in your theory in addition to curvature. Okay? Okay, okay. In these teleparallel theories, Basically, it's different because your uh, your torsion completely takes the role of the curvature. Yeah, you you are so, replacing the curvature with torsion. Yeah, while in einstein cartan theory, you are basically supplementing yes. your curvature yes. by by the torsion, and then this torsion typically uh, measures like a deviation of the einstein cartan gravity. From a GR, yes, yes, yes. And this Einstein, this Einstein Cartan, usually people call it Kibble uh, Yama theory, yes. Actually, it turns out that uh, this uh, torsion is generated only by some like a uh, spin of the matter. So it's usually like non-propagating uh, field in your theory, but it represents some addition. And then people try to, uh, so then what people try to do with that, as then there are many experiments which are trying to detect torsion. And I think this is a very important point because there is many uh, experiments, mainly and a lot of discussion, mainly like 70s and 80s actually, uh, about einstein cartan gravity and people detecting torsion. Yes, but uh, what they talk about is detecting of this einstein cartan torsion, which is additional field in your theory. Yes? Okay. In teleparallel gravity, it's completely different. We have already detected the torsion. Yes, I mean, like yes. when something falls on the ground, well, in GR, you say, oh, it's because of the curvature. Uh, but in teleparallel gravity, oh, it's because of the torsion. <laughs> yes. No. I mean, uh, because uh, technically the have, torsion. This point I have understood quite well. But I, yeah. I, I just have asked because of one reason that in Einstein Kata, if you uh, just switch off the tor torsion, you will get back the usual Einstein theory, the Einstein Hilbert. Yeah, yeah. But here, what is the GR limit of this kind of theory? Yeah, so uh, yes, exactly. Because actually uh, in Einstein Cartan theory, uh, Einstein Cartan theory differ, as I said, this to Einstein Cartan torsion is generated only by the spin of the matter, yes? Mm -hmm. So in, if you take away spinning matter, you obtain GR. Yes. Yes. I mean, in vacuum, uh, GR 
uh, Einstein Cartan and GR are indistinguishable it's because there is no torsion uh, without uh, uh, without uh, spinning matter. Yes. Here, this is different. I mean, this theory is distinct from GR or even in a, in a vacuum. Yeah, so you cannot completely. I mean, I mean here. Yes, you cannot complete like this theory even in vacuum is different from GR. So, so it's not it's not equivalent to Einstein Cartan theory. So the point what is people here, usually here is no GR limit as such. Well, the GR limit is uh, like you have here like then it's done up to like what is your f function yes because yeah. usually you take some kind of like a taylor expansion mm -hmm. of this function f because we typically assume as like we know that our i mean okay it depends like whether you want to do it completely generic generically for like arbitrary f yes but we know that universe and the the world around us is not described by arbitrary f yes i mean like you cannot put there like oh t cube yes because we know that our world around us is more or less to very good agreement described by gr mm -hmm. so so typically what you would expect here is that you would take t plus i don't know some tiny parameter like alpha t square yes okay. and then basically this like small parameter this alpha will be like measuring your deviation will be quanti quantifying your deviation from gr okay yes? so that, that's how usually and of course like if you do like a i don't know this small parameter goes completely to zero you obtain gr yes i mean yes yes so so this is one uh one one thing is ft gravity and it's actually really really in, uh, sorry 12 the incredibly popular subject there's like 500 papers about ft gravity in i hope you are not feeling irritating years. that i am asking so many questions no 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 it's good it's good don't worry don't worry uh, i mean I, I i like to answer the questions so no, i usually uh, ask everyone too many questions <laughs> no no it's okay it's okay okay i like to answer questions so uh but okay this is just one way of basically uh modifying gravity yes i mean like uh, ft gravity because you know fr gravity is very unique because if you don't want to have problem with this ostrokratsky instability is actually fr gravity is one of very few ways how to modify the lagrangian in this ad hoc way Yes, I mean, you cannot go completely like R cube because you will typically have some kind of instabilities there. But in FT gravity, this is not a problem. You can go completely, uh, uh, you can consider completely different locations. And this was actually like how it all started in 1979. Uh, beside FT gravity, which was 2006, 2007. Actually, the first modified gravity model was this new general introduced by Hayashi in 1979. Uh, basically, uh, they take this torsion scalar, what they call new general relativity torsion scalar. They go, no, actually don't call it torsion scalar, but Lagrangian, yes. And we know that for this one specific combination this, of these parameters, C1, C2, and C3, when they're one fourth, one half, and minus one, this Lagrangian is equivalent to GR, right, up to a boundary term. But actually, in principle, you can have here arbitrary coefficients. And this actually will turn out to propagate new gravitational waves. Uh, so this is our paper from 2018. We still have to investigate like whether they are not some problematic because I suspect that for some of these modes, we will obtain some problem. And probably there will be some ghosts somewhere for some combination of these parameters. I mean, at least that's my expectation. But you see, the point of this exercise with this new general relativity is that you can basically uh, start to modify gravity in a completely arbitrary way, I'd say, and still have second order fluid equations. Yes. And there's like a lot of, of these models. 
So like oh, this conformal teleparallel gravity, you can have some kind of like a conformal gravity with second order field equation. I'm using my mouse 2011. Or this various this FPB gravity model or this like T or you know like F of arbitrary favorite letter in alphabet constructed out of this T B G Q and everything. Uh, you can start to go with this F of something. Uh, but you can also start to do like this, what I would call premetric models or axiomatic teleparallel gravity models or Hordaski gravity. I, I mean, there's a lot of ways how you can go about it. And I think at this point, like when we have all this, and all I, I models, have one, one more question. So, yeah. uh, like this formalism is not dependent on dimension, but like once you try to connect with observation, it is basically a three, di three plus one dimensional theory. But like if I consider it in arbitrary dimension, maybe in lower or higher dimension. So is this formalism is valid for any arbitrary dimensions? So yes, actually there are some models. Uh, they even talk about some like a causa Klein theories in teleparallel gravity. They basically try to obtain some kind of like a uh, some kind of green, I don't know, some kind of like effective theory from causa Klein theories, yes. Mm -hmm. And also with some of my colleagues, we are now actually working on some like a black holes in two plus one dimensions and we get to quite fun with problems. Yeah, that's why I have actually asked because apart from uh, testing it in the cosmology side or maybe the, uh, the uh, things you have mentioned, what are the other possibilities when we can actually study this kind of theories? That's why I've asked this question. Yeah, you can go also, you can also go to other dimensions that's not the problem, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. But actually there is like many open questions about this, yes? Uh, I mean, we have a lot of possibilities and uh, if you are, for example, like interested just in cosmology, it turns out like, well, you can't completely like, I think we have so many models that actually we should start. To, we cannot distinguish all these models just by doing cosmology, no matter what people are saying. We should be like trying to understand now physical properties of these models. And I think that many of these models can be actually ruled out on a pure theoretical grounds. Right? Like uh, we should investigate these models now carefully and try to see which of these models are mathematically consistent. Okay. So. Basically, the problems, some open problems. Now I will talk about some open problems, like what we can do with this modified teleparallel gravity theory. So, we'll basically, uh, talk about six open problems which we have with this. Uh, or what kind of questions we can ask with, with all these various modified teleparallel gravity theory. The first is like, Yes, uh, I mean, I'm not very active in this, uh, but this is like the main selling point is to do some kind of cosmology, yeah? some kind of like observational signatures of these teleparallel gravity models. And I mean, like, uh, for example, like FT gravity, this was like one of the main uh, selling points. It's like very simple model. You just take some like a Cartesian, like a diagonal tetrad, you find its torsion scalar, but this is h square, or this h is like other parameter. And then you basically obtain some uh, modified free one equations, and uh, you you can use them to explain some kind of like the dark energy as to these different points. And it's a very rich subject, so I really recommend this uh, review paper by Yifutsai, Salvatore Capitano, Mario Sartidaci, and Maria Felicia from 2016. I mean, I'm not very uh, active in this, uh, co doing cosmology with this, but this is one of the uh, primary fields which people are interested in. So second open question is, so okay, so what is open, open question with cosmology and observation signatures is, well, let's try to find some so one good some thing, observational so, effect so, so of, of modified gravity theories did you have noticed the second equation like if you can able to measure the hubble parameter at late time then you can actually say that you are actually measuring the contribution from the torsion scalar at the late time 
Yeah. It's some some something like that. Yeah, but but this is quite, quite a typical also in other modified gravity theory. Yes, I mean, yes. you always obtain some kind of like a. I mean, Freeman equations are still kind of simple. So usually you obtain something which looks meaningful and you can always test it. Yes, you just must be careful like uh, and about the perturbations and all these uh, details. Yes. Uh, and I will talk why is this problem like. So basically like as far as this observation signatures goes, well, the open question is like, let's, I mean, let's try to find some, really observation signatures of this modified gravity theory yes and uh, that's still an ongoing subject and many people are interested in this so the second open question is like uh, we need to solve these field equations okay? we need to find solutions in these modified theories of gravity because like this prima robertson walker space time Yes, in this we can solve this uh, FT field equations very nicely, and we can solve them also in other modified gravity theories. And this is usually what we can do quite well. But Prima Robertson Walker spacetime is a very useful, very simple spacetime, a very important and very simple spacetime. And it actually cannot completely explain, uh, like, that's not the ultimate test of our theory. Right? If you want to see sometimes some problems, we have to go to more complicated space time than Prima Robertson Walker. And uh, so we need, I think this is one big open question is we really need to find some exact solutions to this theory. And in teleparallel theories, it's actually very interesting what is happening. I mean, in the modified teleparallel gravity theories, what's happening is that we have these two variables, which is this tetrad. And this spin connection is purely inertia spin connection. And they are kind of quasi independent variables. But then actually, the field equations for the spin connection is a very generic feature. They will co coincide with anti symmetric part of the field equations for the theta. So it means that in all these modified gravity theories, modified teleparallel gravity theories, actually turns out that your tetra and uh, spin connection are not determined, uh, are not independent. The field equation somehow forces some relation between them. So, and what turns out, I mean, it's quite interesting, is that typically we can solve the field equations for the spin connection independently from the one from tetra, from the symmetric part of the tetra field equation. And this is still quite unsure whether this is due to some special symmetry or it indicates something about the nature of the degrees of freedom here. And I think this is quite interesting subject right so like when i say look for the solutions we can be looking for full solutions but also just for the solutions for the spin connection and it's quite uh, interesting uh, interesting subject but then as not just it we also have to look for the full solutions not for the spin connection but also for the tetrad to actually determine the metric the new metric solution right? so for example so we really have to search for black hole solutions in FT gravity. So for example, in FT gravity, we take this uh, diagonal tetra with this kind of spin connection, we lead to distortion scalar, and we can write the field equations and we find out that these field equations are given by this. They are kind of complicated. In some cases, we can show that similar as in FR gravity, the GR black hole solutions with uh, constant torsion scalar are solutions of also FT gravity or arbitrary FT gravity. But that's kind of a trivial solution. We really have to search for the new uniquely FT gravity solutions. Right? We really have to find some black hole solutions in FT gravity. Uh, there are some in recent one or two years, there was some quite uh, some progress with this, mainly with perturbative solutions. Okay? So I mean, like uh, take just some GR solution, then introduce a small perturbation and try to find perturbative black hole solutions. But I think we should still also search for uh, like exact solutions of FT gravity black holes. So that's why uh, with my colleagues, we are now looking for two plus one dimension of black holes in FT gravity. Because, well, I was personally hoping that it would be simpler in FT gravity in two plus one dimensions, uh, but it's turning out to be also quite complicated, <laughs> also in two plus one dimensions. 
So there's still something interesting going on here in the problem of energy. <coughs> so that's one thing is that, uh, yeah, let's find some solutions. Uh, there's a big open question is like, we need to have definitely more solutions, mainly black hole solutions in the future. But then also, we have to understand better these dynamics of electric gravity. And why we have to understand it is because uh, FT gravity is interesting because it has some very, very unique uh, dynamics, which seems to be very confusing because it seems that the, if you take a perturbative level, there are no extra degrees of freedom in FT gravity. Mainly if you do it uh, around like Minkowski space time or Prima Robertson Walker space time, at least to a first order in perturbation, there perturbatively there are no degrees of freedom, no extra degrees of freedom propagate. Right? As you can see very easily, like if you are in Minkowski space time, with infinite of small perturbation, you see why it's happening because torsion scalar is proportional to the square of this derivative of the of the two of, of, of this uh, perturbation. Yes? While in the Ricci scalar, you have this term here, which is linear. Okay, so it's quite clear that at the first order of the perturbation, actually, uh, FT gravity, you will not see any, any change. But actually, it turns out that if you go like further orders, there was some calculation by uh, Tommy Koisko and Alexei Golovnev, which they showed that actually these degrees of freedom appear at the higher orders of perturbation theory, which is very weird because it means that there is some the nature, the physical nature of this big extra degree of freedom in FT gravity is like inherently non perturbative, which is very weird. And it means usually people call this a strong gravity problem or strong coupling problem. And yeah, it means that some of these degrees of freedom are somehow strongly coupled. They don't, they are not uh, this perturbative degree of freedom. And this is a big problem because uh, since these degrees of freedom and FT gravity, they are like this non perturbative, we must introduce some, like, we must use some non perturbative counting of these degrees of freedom, which is much more complicated than doing it in a perturbative. Like, perturbative is very easy. Take FT gravity, we would take, I don't know, uh, FR gravity, and you just do perturbations, you just look which. Uh, terms, really, I mean, which term, uh, which components really propagate, and you will see that you have two plus one propagating degrees of freedom. The perturbative techniques. In uh, FT gravity, you can actually use it. I mean, uh, you have to do like a full Hamiltonian anal uh, analysis, yeah, so some kind of, I don't know, matrix, like in massive gravity. I don't know what you have to do, but you have to devise a non perturbative counting of degrees of freedom. And it's a big problem because. Uh, as I said, there's 500 papers about FT gravity, and still people are not completely sure how many degrees of freedom are there in FT gravity. And uh, there seems to be like a series of, I think, four different papers by, uh, first is from 2011 by Mio uh, and, and company by Ferraro and Guzman 2018, and now Blagojevich and Esther in 2020. And they kind of disagree whether there is one or three extra degrees of freedom. And if, if you have this extra degrees of freedom, you have to actually uh, uh, analyze whether there are, how they are propagated. Yes? I mean, whether they are not causing some problems with a causality or they are not propagating super -obedient. Yes, for example, there is this paper from 2013 by Yen Chinong, who is listening, and uh, Jim Nestor and Pisin Chen, and, Case of Izumi, or it basically showed that uh, there is a possibility some causal degrees of freedom appearing in the figure. Uh, our results in this new general relativity show that there should be causal figure out, which is also very confusing. I completely don't understand this actually, uh, this result. So it means that this is a big open question 
Like how unique is also this evolution? Like what is the nature of this non perturbative degrees of freedom and how to you know, uh, make any sense out of it? I, I, still, I still don't know. Really. Yes. Uh, so basically, uh, this is the, one of the biggest question is basically to understand which of these modified gravity theories are consistent. And I think more than focusing on cosmology, we should actually focus on the origin of these degrees of freedom. For example, I'm now, uh, oh, sorry, but uh, I'm actually trying to understand this origin of degrees of freedom from like kind of broken symmetry and their, uh, their number and nature. Yes? Because usually this strong gravity problem, maybe strong coupling implies that there is some kind of ghost. Yes? So this is something like a, uh, situation in the, with uh, massive gravity in the 1970s. In massive gravity, people were able to, like 20 years later, they were able to uh, solve the problem in massive gravity, apparently. It's a question whether we will be able to solve it in FP gravity, yeah? whether we will be able to avoid this problem of this strong coupling or not. Probably not. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> uh, what is very curious is that is my current project is. Uh, I'm trying to, it turns out that it's not just the problem like how many degrees of freedom are there, but it turns that they, it's non-fixed degrees of freedom. What I mean by this is uh, uh, there seems to be some very peculiar way in gravity how the degrees of freedom, when they become propagating and they're not being propagate, propagated, like it means that when they become gauge degrees of freedom and when they become physical propagation degrees of freedom, there's some very, very curious dynamics dynamics happening here as my current work, uh, which I'm trying to do. And so basically the big question is like, well, we should try to understand this uh, problem much better and try to answer like what, which of these modified theories are actually consistent and which of these theories you know, avoid all these problems, mainly this problem of you know, some kind of propagating those. So basically, yeah, so basically that's, that's it. So basically the conclusion, conclusions of this talk is that the stellar parallel theories of gravity are a natural framework to both understand general relativity from a novel perspective, but they also formulate studying new extended models of gravity. And I, at least for me, these are two completely different subjects, yes? I mean, like, even if this modified gravity theory turns out to be not leading anywhere, you can still use teleporal gravity to understand the relativity. So it means that uh, there's a lot of this interesting insight, like the gravity can be published in terms of curvature, torsion, or even maybe non metricity with this other uh, symmetric teleporal gravity. So I think this is a very deep insight what is gravity. Yes? And we should try to explore it more. As far as, and there is a, now I just, I, I think I already talked too long, like one and a half hour. So basically, this is just the list of these open problems in parallel theories of gravity, just to list them, uh, uh, what I consider to be the most pressing open problems in both teleparallel points of general relativity. And also in all these modified theories of gravity, such as FP gravity, NGR, and all these other pressing gravity theories. So, thank you. And if you want to learn more, uh, well, two years ago we have finished some uh, topical review on this uh, subject about the stellar theories of gravity, illuminating fully in the modern approach. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the nice talk. And uh, I'm sorry that I have asked many questions if you're feeling... No, no, it's okay. Yeah. So if other people wants to ask questions, please ask. Uh, there is no issue. And before asking the question, please unmute and give a clap for Martin for giving such a nice talk for the forum QSTM. Uh, so... Uh, now you guys can ask question.
if there is any question please ask or no question then you can contact martin and uh, there are references also you can look through it i i hope some of the colleagues of yours are also attending so they knows about that if there are some unknown people then uh, uh, they can reach martin also martin is also very active in facebook as well <laughs> um and uh, yeah this talk will be posted in youtube and uh, you guys look into the material and you can contact martin if you have any specific question so thank you martin for this contribution and uh, uh, stay safe and healthy in this pandemic time that's all yeah thank you thank you you too uh, uh yeah so, uh, so, so uh, we can then uh, talk about it because you wanted to also uh, answer yes. questions about some yes. possible yes. project. Yes. So I, I think after this talk, we can have better, uh, you know, <laughs> to, today, uh, to, better today, communication today, about this. Today, today uh, after this talk, uh, maybe in future, maybe this week, I will not refer. Next week, I will talk to you if you have time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, we can have some. Uh, so I'm actually participating in a conference which is called Strings. Which is going on okay. for two weeks right now. So apart from having that, I am just continuing this conference, uh, uh, this QSTM talk, because I don't want to stop it. Because a lot of students are following this. So uh, uh, yeah, so like we can chat more and uh, we can come up with some common in interest area. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Okay. So bye for now and uh, all of you, those who are attending, thank you for attending this talk and listening to Martin. And as I have said, you can contact Martin after seeing this talk. You can go to my YouTube channel or you can type QASTM in YouTube. You can see all the previous talks, including this one. So this will be the 92nd talk in the series. So you, will, you can see all the talks there. Uh, probably Martin have looked through the link. I have already shared the link with you before. Uh, anyways, uh, so Martin, bye for now. And uh, I know that this is quite late at your place because it is probably 11 o'clock or 12, 12 o'clock midnight, I think. No, it's just 9, 9, 9.45. Oh, 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 okay, 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 okay. okay. Uh, well, I'm just okay. confusing okay. Korea. Because Korea and ah, Japan, yeah. it is like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. And I'm a quite a, a night creature, so it's okay. <laughs> but okay, thanks a lot for inviting me, and I was very happy to, uh, to have this. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we can chat more about the work and all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Bye. Okay.